Thank you for the Yes, thank you. Okay, why don't we start with a word of prayer and then we're going to look at some slides. Father, we are grateful for bringing us here tonight so that we can study that word. And uh, Lord, we're grateful, as always, for giving us the uh, freedom and the privilege to study Christian suffering. And Lord, we're grateful as well for the techniques and the principles as found in our textbook so that we can stabilize during those rough times. Lord, if there's any sins, we name them to you in the privacy of our hearts, knowing full well that uh, you'll forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We do this, of course, Lord, not to establish a relationship for the first time, but for those who have an established relationship. We use this so that we can recover from broken fellowship. We know that the mandate is not to grieve nor quench the spirit, and when we do, we're operating from the energy of the flesh, which guarantees that we will sin and fall on a consistent basis. So thank you, Father, for this opportunity. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, tonight, I decided I'm going to take you through what's called the 10 problem-solving devices. <clears throat> and basically, this is, again, something that the theme had developed, and it's built on um, the divine dinosphere. Let me see if I can get my... Uh... Remember on page 7 of the book, um, this is basically what we have been studying, right? The various gates. And uh, remember gate 1 is the tower, which deals with the filling ministry of the Spirit. And then there's the basic modus operandi, which consists of rebound or confession. And then faith resting. And then there's what's called the enforced or genuine humility. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the book, by the way. Okay. So it's not what's on the slide here. Oh. But we're going to look at this tonight. So we won't be using the text. We will be looking at the 10 problem-solving devices because it will help clarify some of the things that we've studied thus far. Uh, gate 3... Uh, Genuine humility or in enforced humility. Gate four is uh, momentum, perception, and application of Bible doctrine. Uh, gate five is spiritual self-esteem, and it's the personal love for God. Gate six is spiritual autonomy, and it gives you the ability at this point to have impersonal love for mankind and remember. The difference between uh, loving someone and, Im and then the impersonal love for someone. Mm -hmm. The impersonal love for someone, I, I have to stress this, it's so important. Impersonal love depends on you, right? Not on the person, not on their attractiveness, not on the fact that they're reciprocating and being nice to you. They could be extremely... Uh, they, they, they could be a pest, they could be a problem, they could be an annoyance. But you can still love them in an impersonal way because of the virtue that's stored up in your soul, mm -hmm. right? Because of your love for God, gate five. So gate six is impersonal love for, man, uh, love for mankind. Gate seven, God puts you through what's called momentum testing. He accelerates your spiritual growth. He gives you these tests 
so that you can advance to the next level. The more that you trust God, the more you'll trust Him for bigger and uh, greater challenges in life. And then ultimately the end, uh, the, the ultimate goal is spiritual maturity, right? So as you're advancing from gate 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, you're advancing, you're maturing. And remember, it's so important to, to recognize this. If you wrestle with a sin issue, if there is sin that's kicking your butt, the only way to resolve that is through spiritual growth and maturity. Okay? So when people say, I'm only human, well, I can say, I'm only human too. You can too. But God has given us tremendous resources so that we can minimize those sins. Not because of our strength and our volition, but because of His empowerment that's available to us as we apply these uh, prop, 10 problem-solving devices. Some call it, uh, Robbie Dean calls it the 10 stress busters. And so the idea is, is if you apply doctrine, that's all these are, 10 categories, and these are doctrines, and if you apply these things, you should see advance, advancement in your spiritual walk. Okay? So if you don't know these, or if you're not exercise, exercising these uh, problem-solving devices, then you're probably at a certain level, and you're not going to advance above that. Okay? So let's take a look at this. What's number one? We studied this. Rebound. Mm -hmm. Remember, these are things that we should be doing on a regular basis. Do you want to know what it looks like to mature? What's the curriculum? What's the track to advance the spiritual believer or the believer to the next level? Well, it's 1 through 10. Number one, rebound. It's confession alone to God alone. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to what? Forgive us. Forgive us and cleanse us from all righteousness. So if Rena commits ten sins and she remembers three and she confesses three, how many are forgiven? All. All of them. Because she forgot the other seven, God extends grace. She remembers the three, God takes care of the other seven, totally ten. So if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay? We'll look at this in, in a greater detail in the next few slides. Number two, filling of the Holy Spirit. This seems to be a, a, a tough one for some. But the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit in its uh, core really is the influence of the Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine, but be <coughs> filled with the Spirit. You get pulled over because you're, you have alcohol in your system. They give you a DUI. You're driving under the influence. They don't say you're driving under drunk. You're driving under the influence. And Paul says, I don't want you to be under the influence of alcohol. I want you to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine. Don't be influenced with wine, but be influenced or filled with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay? So when you're influenced by the Spirit, you'll make better decisions. Okay? Number three, faith rest drill. What's the faith rest drill? Promises. Resting on promises. You're Rolling resting on promises. That's why it's so important to know these. We're at number three out of ten. The first one, confess, get you back on the gray, uh, get you back into the white circle. Number two is influence of the Holy Spirit. Number three, you're going through hardship. You get hit with all these problems. Relationships are strained. What do you do? Number three, faith rest. What's that look like? Lord, you said that those who love you, you will cause all things to work together for good. How do I know I love you? Because Jesus specifically said, if you love me, obey me. And as far as I'm aware, I have been obeying you. And when I fall, when I make a mistake, I know that I make my peace with you. So I'm claiming Romans 8.28. I know that I got hit with the news today 
but I'm going to rest in your care. You're bigger than my problem. You are my God. You are my Father. You, I have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit batting on my behalf. Is there anybody bigger and better than them? No. So when you start to draw from the Word, you can faith rest. We're not supposed to be losing our cool because when we say that when we stress and we're anxious for things, then we're in essence doubting God. Mm -hmm. So when the person says, oh, if I were there and I saw the Red Sea part, if I saw him raise someone from the dead, if I saw him cast demons out, boy, my faith would skyrocket. Didn't change much when the people around saw him. I doubt that it'll change <coughs> us. If, if it's going to change, it'll be the direct result of you seeing and reading it and being persuaded from the Word itself. If you tell me, you know what, that's awesome. I, could, I can't even begin to imagine how the Red Sea would look like as, it, as, as I'm walking through the sea's part. But boy, if it happened, I believe it. I'm trusting that God's Word, the word is true. If you tell me something like that, then I'll say that you would be surprised and you would be at awe and you would probably be affected in a good way. You may not be one of the ones that were grumbling and wanting Moses stone because they were hungry and wishing for steak. But you remember when we were slaves, at least we had something to eat. Now all we have is this manna from heaven. I'm bored. And so what does he do? God sends fiery serpents to bite five to six million Israelites in, in the wilderness to discipline them. But then he does something interesting. He says, I want you to craft a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, and tell people to look up. And those who look up, I know who looks, those who look up will be saved. They will not die. So five to, six, five to seven million, I think, people out in the wilderness, he has enough fiery serpents slithering in the ankles of his people. And he says, okay, are you going to trust me? Are you going to believe me? Well, I want you to look up on that pole and don't look down. <clears throat> look up. Mm -hmm. Because that's one of the few times lately that you've been looking up. So if you want to be delivered, look my way. Look up at the pole and stare at the serpent. Disregard the sensation flowing around your ankles and feet. Don't listen to your kids. Have your kids look up. Hold their heads up so that they won't die. Don't worry if they get bit. Trust me. Dad, I got bit. Look up. Mom, I got bit. Look up. God said, Jehovah God says, look up. We'll deal with the pain later, honey. Look up. Look at me. Look up. And those who looked up and in faith lived. And when you look at John 3, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, just as the serpent was lifted up, so must the Son of Man be. So that by faith, by looking to Christ, you will be saved. And then, for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him, non-meritorious, will be saved. Okay? So faith rests. The more we're familiar with His Word, our confidence in Him goes up, and it supports and buttresses Romans 10, 17. Do, if you know, faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. I don't have enough faith. We'll get into the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. So, faith, uh, number three, if you're anemic in that area, you, don't, you can't rest, you're stressing out, draw from His Word. Listen to His Word. Get into His Word. Just like friendships, right? I mean, we talked about this the last few weeks, right? Let's say you met Sarah for the first time. Do you trust Him? No. <laughs> so Rafi doesn't know Sarah. But over the course of time, if you are given the opportunity to know him over the course of time, 
you'll be in a better position to say yay or nay. And if you trust him, it's not because you met him for the second or third time. It's because you've gotten to know him over time. You can't hit the Bible once in a while and say, I trust you, God. I can faith rest. I can do number three. That's like saying, I met Sarah for the third time, so now I trust him. That doesn't make sense, does it? And what makes you think you could do that with your relationship with God? Get to know Him on Sunday only. And over the course of one year, oh, we've been down that road, two days. We didn't spend enough time. Right? Mm -hmm. So number three is faith rest. You can rest, and these verses, if we have time, maybe we'll look at them later. Faith rest drill. Number four, grace orientation. Once you understand the grace that has been extended to you, you'll then extend it to others. You have no reason to withhold grace unless you are going to put yourself above God himself. It's a precarious position to be in. Number five, doctrinal orientation. You orient yourself to doctrine and things will smoothen out. <coughs> Lives will be transformed. Not because you're trying harder, you're making a bargain with God, you're promising God, you're committing yourself to God. No, because he's transforming you from the inside out as you're taking his word. There's power in the word. There's power in God. There's nothing in us. Mm -hmm. But with God, we can do all things, according to Paul. Personal sense of destiny. We'll talk more about that later on. You think you don't have any objectives. You don't know what God has in store for you. Well, the moment you are adopted into the family of God, that is his stamp of approval, that you're a winner. He has a plan for you. He's allowing you to live. If he's finished with you, he'll take you home. If he's not finished with you, it doesn't matter what you are going through. It doesn't matter how weak you are. It doesn't matter whether or not you have a job. What matters is if you are willing to acquiesce to him. If you love me, obey me. It's you and God, God and you. So there's that personal sense of destiny. Number seven, personal love for God. Romans 8.28, we talked about that. Then the unconditional love for all mankind. How can we love all of mankind, especially those who are not a part of the faith? That's impersonal, right? That's impersonal love, and that depends on you. Okay. So if I need to, if I don't know Rafi, and if he is saying all this and all that, and, and we're clashing because of our personality, I'm soft and soft-spoken and reserved, and he's more animated, we might clash. But because of the virtue that's in me, or him, he can love me, I can love him. Not because he's like me, and not because I'm like him, but because of our love for God. But the moment we talk about personal love, that's because now I know Rafi, I like Rafi, he's a nice guy, gregarious, very good helper, and vice versa. Because we know each other, we're not an acquaintance anymore. <coughs> We've spent time, we work together, we're co-laborers in Christ. That's the normal protocol in relationships and friendships. When you get to know someone over time, the friendship should get what? Closer and closer. Closer and closer and closer and even stronger, right? What do you think we have to do with our relationship with God? Have to, we have to get stronger and stronger and stronger, closer and closer and closer, so that it becomes easier and easier and easier to trust Him. Mm -hmm. So when you get hit with a problem, you don't have to doubt Him. You don't have to wonder whether or not He will come through for you. But if you don't know Him enough, you're going to doubt that's normal and natural for anybody. Even the disciples doubted, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Who is this guy that even the waters and winds will obey him? What? Are you serious? <clears throat> you know what? You guys are hallucinating. I need to see Jesus for myself. I need to put this finger into his hands and into his side. Who said that? They spent time with him for three and a half years. We've been spending time 
more than three and a half years, most of us. Mm -hmm. So we should be at a point where we can trust him, irregardless of what goes on in our life. Mm -hmm. I lost my job. It's okay. God has a plan for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I have a family. Oh, he's taking care of my family. A bird won't fall to the ground without my father is knowing, and neither is there every hair is accounted for in a person's head. So that means he's watching and he's paying attention to the details. Are we not more important than the sparrows? Mm -hmm. yes. So when you have these doctrines stored up in your soul and you're not in the mood to read because you got hit with bad news or a challenge, God the Holy Spirit will bring these things to remembrance. This is the reason why we study now. When the military go in for boot camp, they train, 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 almost 24 hours, 7, so that they'll be willing to lay their life down for their country. They go in, they're timid, they're, they, I can't, I don't know if I can handle this. Honey, I miss you, get me out of here, this is I'm miserable. <laughs> and they go in wimps, they, they, they shave their head, they, they, but what happens when they finish boot camp? They can stand at attention for hours at a time. Even if it's raining, they will take a bullet for you because they've been inculcated with doctrine, military doctrine. Marinated. Hmm? <laughs> I just want to use the word marinated. <laughs> so they have all this stored up inside and it changes their perspective. We're supposed to have changed perspective too. Mm -hmm. And our perspective changes as we align our thinking with His. Set our minds on the things above. above yeah. <coughs> Colossians. Right? Yeah, Colossians. And as we do this, guess what? Does that mean we're gonna all we're gonna do is talk about the Bible 24 hours, 24/7? No. You're gonna be like Christ, who was loved and well received by many, <coughs> except for the religious crowd. So you'll be loved among the brethren. You'll be a favorite at work because you'll be honest. You'll be punctual. You'll be reliable, trustworthy. Are those not good characteristics? Well, wouldn't you be hated first? No. Well, it depends. If you're being honest, punctual, truthful, no. <coughs> but if you're making a stand and saying, you know, uh, excuse me one second, I, I want to say grace for my meal. Oh, gosh, here's one of those guys. Now, they'll ridicule you, ridicule you, or make fun of you, or say, you know what, don't talk to Marissa, she's one of those <coughs> people. Yeah. There's Bible thumpers. But if you live your life mm -hmm. that's consistent with the Word, actually people will be attracted to it. It's the moment you start mentioning Jesus that people repel. Mm -hmm. But think about it. You live out the principles in Scripture. I would have difficulty finding someone who would not appreciate being kind, being generous, being caring, being giving. Mm -hmm. But the moment you mention Jesus Christ, oh, you're a religious kook, huh? You're, you want me to be born again, huh? Once saved, always saved? Oh. They come up with all kinds of things. So sometimes it's not a good idea to preach at work, especially during work time, work out. But you can share with your life and it'll influence them because who wouldn't want someone that's kind and, and honest and trustworthy? Mm -hmm. I always tell people, well, you know what, they won't let me read my Bible here, they heckle me. Well, you know, there's two ways to deal with that. One, don't get them upset at you by putting a stumbling block in front of them. Mm -hmm. You can go to your car and read and then come back a little early and mix with them so that they know that, hey, He's actually a pretty cool person too. She's a pretty nice person as well. So you don't want them to just you don't want to just carry your family Bible in the lunch table. <laughs> I have the right. Yeah. yeah right. Now you make enemies. Mm -hmm. And I understand some people uh, they are convicted to do that kind of thing. But for me, I I always examine the life of Christ, and if he's not wanted somewhere, he doesn't he doesn't press it. Mm -hmm. Even his disciples would go into the city if they don't accept you. Just a few. Mm -hmm. brush, the, brush the dust off your feet and go. 
right? Mm -hmm. Care for them, but don't be, don't, don't uh, be a problem. Mm -hmm. Don't be a thorn in their flesh. Mm -hmm. So unconditional love for all mankind, that's gate six when you look at the divine dynasty, and that's related to your virtue, the virtue that's in you. Number nine, sharing the happiness of God. If you're, hap if you're experiencing the joy and the happiness of God, you are content. Doesn't matter if you have a lot or little, you're content, you're happy because you're sharing His happiness. And lastly, occupation with Christ, Philippians 1, 20 to 21. So let's, let's take a look at some of this here. <coughs> Number one, by rebound. Means to bounce back. It's a sporting term, right? Especially in basketball, you mm -hmm. drop the ball, you recover. To, to bounce back into fellowship with God by naming, admitting, acknowledging, or citing known sins to Him. Mm -hmm. Notice how I said no, known sins. Because you can't remember the sins that you don't remember, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the reason why, you know, it's known sins. And he'll take care of the ones that we forget. We, when we name or admit our known sins to God, he not only forgives us those sins, he purifies us from all wrongdoing, sins we did not know were sins, and sins we have forgotten. Rebound solves the problem of one. What's the first one? So if you're out of fellowship with God, you grieve Him, confess the sin. Number two, controlled by the sin nature. So when you rebound, it gets you back. You're no longer under the control of the sin nature or the influence of the sin nature. I use control because sometimes I know people feel like they're being controlled by their sin nature. Right? Oh, it's so hard. So I put the word control. So being controlled by their sin nature. So confession solves that problem. Why does it solve the problem? Well, you're under the influence of the sin nature because you're at odds with God. There's no empowerment, no influence, no direction from God when you're dabbling with sin. So what you do at this point is name the sin. Lord, this is the 1,000th time today that I fell. I know you're getting tired of it, but your word says to confess it, and I want to stay true to the word. And when you do, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I, I say this because I want people to know that God is fully aware of all the things we've done, past, present, and future. I'm not using this as a license to say you can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Because what I'll say is if you keep doing it, you'll get disciplined. God knows how to take care of you. He knows how to take care of me. Who, whom the Lord loves, He will discipline. Discipl to be under the disciplining hand of God is never, is never pretty. Oh, yes. Yeah. I can say Never, never. It's, it's not a nice experience. And number three, quenching or grieving the Holy Spirit. So don't grieve, don't quench the Spirit. Grieving is when you sin. You said something bad, you thought something bad, boom. You grieve the Spirit. So what do you do? You confess. Quenching the Spirit is when you resist Him. You're staying in the sin. Kind of like the prodigal son. He did something wrong. He left. And he stayed in that, in, in that sin apart from the Father for a while. Right? So, Robbie? So quenching and grieving are, are different. The are, they're different, right? Yeah, they're different. So grieving is, let's say, I said, oh, <coughs> Raphael's leaving. <laughs> and let's say that was a sin in my, in my mind I, well I grieved the spirit and then I said oh I shouldn't have said that I shouldn't have thought that Lord um, that wasn't proper so that I recovered I was in the gray for 10 seconds I went back to the light mm -hmm. now I live in sin I, 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 I have a meeting with you guys and say guys you know what I want to uh, thank you for supporting HBI, and uh, you've been here for quite some time on Thursday nights, but uh, effective July, I'm resigning. You know, I don't want to do this anymore. 
I don't believe in God anymore, or whatever. And I go off and live to myself. I'm now quenching the Holy Spirit. I'm staying away from God. I'm resisting Him. It's not an accidental <clears throat> two-second sin. It's a lifestyle. I'm purposely staying away. I don't care for it anymore. I'm resisting God. I'm not listening to Him anymore. I want to live my life to myself. Probably. It's almost like suppressing it. Yeah, it's suppressing the truth. Oh, okay. That's the Romans 1. Romans 1. Okay. So if I do this long enough, God will eventually turn me over to myself. You remember what happens when he turns us over to ourselves? Oh, yeah. You guys remember? Right. Turn, turn to Romans. Uh, just in case some of you haven't seen this before. Very important. Some of our on rebound. Um, Rena, can you read... You have a good voice. You have your Bible, 18 to 32. Check it. One, Romans oh. 1. <clears throat> Listen closely and notice what's happening here. And I'm going to point out a couple verses, three verses. 18, 18 to 32? Yes. 32. Uh, 32. Yeah, um, it's not okay. Uh, who can read eighteen to thirty-two? I have it. You have it. Okay. <clears throat> but God knows His anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because He has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have been have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see His invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. <clears throat> yes, they know God. They knew God. But they wouldn't worship Him as God or even give Him thanks. And they began to think of half foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever living God, they worship idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to their whatever shameful things their hearts desire. As a result, they did violent, degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worship and serve the things God created instead of the Creator Himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. <clears throat> that is why God abandoned them in their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulge in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffer within themselves and penalty they deserve. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, He abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness: seeing, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers. Haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, and are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do, not, who do these things deserve to die, yet they do not do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Sound like today? Yes, yep. absolutely. And I want you to notice a few things here. Oh, and um, I Sarah, you have your Bible open? No. Okay. Romans one. DJ. Okay. Uh, read twenty four, twenty six, and twenty eight, and pause at each one. Twenty four first. Verse twenty four. Therefore, God also gave them up to an. In 
the last of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Okay. So the therefore is there because of 22 and 23. Mm -hmm. yep. So when you read verse 18, Arlene, what's it say, verse 18? The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Okay, so when is the wrath being revealed? Right now. Right, right now. now. <clears throat> Not in the future. Mm -hmm. Some people say, oh, the wrath of God is when the tribulation will take place and so on and so forth. Paul says that the wrath is revealed, is being revealed yeah. now. Yeah. How does it look like? Well, beginning with verse 24, God is giving them up to themselves. So the wrath of God, the punishment, or the discipline here, is that if you want to exchange or profess to be wise and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like man and birds and four-footed animals, God will give you over to yourself. 24 <coughs> says, because of this, therefore, God gave them up to uncleanness. So that, that restraining hand of God has been lifted. Prior to that, He was preventing and protecting them. But when you continue to suppress the truth about God, He will allow you to experience His wrath. 24 is wrath number one. He turns you over to uncleanness. Mm -hmm. Rafi. He's basically saying, you want to do it? Lock yourself yeah, up here. Yeah. He's going to allow you to do it without, because he's not going to participate in that. He's going to allow you to experience what it looks like to be without his word. Okay? Mm. DJ? Isn't he doing this because they're suppressing it and they already know in their, inside them there's a God? Yeah. As we read, uh, as we read the, the first few verses, they know God. Yeah. They do, yeah. So there's actually no such thing as an atheist unless you willfully choose to ignore and reject God. Mm -hmm. Because God in His Word says that what may be known is manifest or made known in them. See? Please. God protects us. Mm -hmm. We're like sheep. When we don't live here to master His voice and go out by itself. I think He kind of let us let the wolves loose. Mm -hmm. You know, keep the wolves back. Yeah. And I think the wolf is our old sin nature within yeah. ourselves. Hey. And that's the one that attacks us the most. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the sin nature definitely will attack us, but we can, we're, we're struggling with that daily. Yeah. Okay. But, the, but the wrath that he's displaying here is when he actually turns them over to himself. That's the wolf. Well, not the, not the, not the sin nature. Well, he turns them over to themselves, their the sin, sin nature. Yeah, he them over. But even, like for example, us, we haven't suppressed the truth, so we're not in this level. We're not experiencing this. He hasn't abandoned us. We may struggle with the sin nature, mm -hmm. but this is a very unique passage in that when you suppress the truth long enough, God will eventually turn you over to yourself, and He's not going to provide any kind of protection from yourself. That's it. I was trying to get at it. That I think he sometimes keeps our own sin nature at bay. That's right. It is. Yeah, That's true. That's true. I totally yeah. agree with yeah. that. And then when he finally turns you over, it's like letting the wolves That's right. Let That's your right. old sin nature take over. Yeah. That's and what you, you mean. Yes. Everything you tempt yourself with, you become... Now you're out of control. You were being devolved. Yeah. Being eaten yeah. by yourself. Yeah. That's exactly it. But what I'm showing you here is what is the wrath that's being revealed? Well, wrath number one is 24. Mm -hmm. He turns you over. <coughs> he, he gave them up to uncleanness. God doesn't give us up to uncleanness. But if you suppress the truth long enough, He can give you up to yourself. So that the sin nature will take its course, run its course, and you'll be out of control. And we'll look at this in the just more roughly. It, is this also aimed in some way or another as a form of punishment? Is, is, yes. It's a form of discipline. Yes, it is. It is a form of discipline. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'll show you the, the, the remedy for this.
But I want you to see what's going on. DJ? Is this for everyone? Or yes. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I think, uh, of course, this is written to the believers. Mm -hmm. The believers in uh, the recipients of this letter were struggling with these sins from 18 to 32. In verse 24, he said, God let them go in there and do whatever shameful thing their yeah. heart desires. Oh, I'm thinking. As a that, result, they did vain, disgraceful yeah. things with each other's bodies. That's, Instead yeah. of believing what they knew was the truth about God, they yeah. deliberately chose to believe the lies. Yeah. And the thing is, it's their own lives. It's not someone else's lives. It's their own yeah. lives. Yeah. That's destroyed. Oh, words, I think... God's wrath is basically keeping, protecting us against ourselves. Yeah. Well, the wrath here is not protecting us. The wrath here is being, he, he is being displayed by letting us yeah. Yeah. Uh, experience experience the uncleanness. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what, let me let me just finish here. DJ, you had something. Yeah. Okay. Let me just finish uh, these three things so that you can see that God is actually stepping back. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is the wrath that's found in 18 to 32. There is the sin nature. All of us experience the sin nature. We wrestle with the sin nature. But we're not suppressing the truth. That's the reason why we're here. We love the truth. We love God. But this category, these people here, these are being revealed, verse 18, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who is suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. We're not practicing unrighteousness here. Mm -hmm. It's not a way of life. We stumble. We make mistakes. So we confess and rebound. These guys are suppressing the truth. You know what suppressing means? They're holding it down. They're making a volitional act and they're suppressing the truth. And what was it? What did they say in 22 and 23? Well, they changed the glory of God. Are you doing this? Are you exchanging the glory of God into an image? Birds and four-footed animals? Not in, nobody here. Mm -hmm. But those people who do this, 24 is the consequence to 22 and 23. Because of this, God gave them, the Four ones who are worshipping this image, four-footed animals, to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. That's number one. Notice the next one, Mitch. Can you read 26 and 27? <clears throat> For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what it is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, <coughs> and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Okay. So 24, uh, 26 and 27 is because in 25 they exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature or the individual or the person rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. Amen. So when a person keeps God out of the picture and suppresses the truth and puts more value in the creature or persons, then God will turn that person over. Mm -hmm. What does it look like? <clears throat> All of a sudden the women are, hey, you're pretty. So are you. Tom, you're cute. So are you, Freddie. Let's get married. That's God turning the person over to self. Now watch this. Is that wrath number two? That's wrath number two. That's the reason why in 24, uh, 26, for this reason, which was preceded by 25, God gave them up to vile passions. That's wrath number two. <coughs> That's wrath number two. Mm -hmm. Okay? So wrath number two is all of a sudden, same sex is looking at each other. It's distorted. I love you. I love you too. Adam and Steve. Adam, Adam and Steve. Steve. You know, not Adam and Eve, Adam and Steve. So now they just want to because God has given them up to themselves. Now prior to this, there was a restraint. But somehow, it got to the point where 26 became a reality. For this reason, 
God gave them over or gave them up to vile passions. Last one. Um, Rafi, 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, again, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, who, 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 knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only to do the same, but also approve of those who practice that. Okay, now watch this. This is wrath number what? Three. 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 <clears throat> now, what? Why is God turning them over to themselves? What's the reason why God is turning them over? Because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They were refusing right. to acknowledge God. Yeah, acknowledge Him, right? They were refusing to even yeah. acknowledge God. Look at, look at. For this reason. 26, uh, or wait, wait, 28. 28, even as they did not like to, what's retain? Keep. 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 They did not like to keep God in their thinking. Mm -hmm. God gave them over to a warped mind. Mm -hmm. So this were the people that once accepted and believed that and yes. believed walk away from it? This is when the believer suppresses the truth about God. So that's really possible. That's possible. And, and, and it's this. written to the believers here yeah. in Romans. This is why if believers would get grounded in the Word, the sooner they get grounded, the more they spend time in the Word, all those secret sins or those struggles will start to, uh, to diminish over time. They don't have to come up and say, oh, I'm coming out of the closet. No. As, if the person is sitting in here, as they're getting grounded and, and uh, saturated with the scripture, those sins will diminish. They're no longer suppressing the truth. And if they're confessing, if they're rebounding, and they're taking in the word, it could deliver them. And we'll, but that's a very good, very good observation. And this is taking place among brethren. Brethren, yeah. That's why that list of, from uh, 20, uh, 28 to 32. It's too many. You're, you're, you're thinking it's what we're seeing in the news? But in the next chapter, he tells you what, who he's talking about. And who's he talking to? Or? He said, you may be saying what horrible people you have been talking about, but you are just as bad as you yeah. have not. Yeah. He said, you are Ew. bad. It's the brethren. It's the brethren, yeah. Rafi. It's, it's like a great, this is a great representation of the unbeliever. Yeah. It's a great representation of the unbeliever or the believer who is purposely suppressing the truth. Mm -hmm. When you suppress the truth, you're going to get hit in three different ways. It's called reversionism. It's reversionism. Mm -hmm. What is it? At its reversionism? peak. Reversionism. reversionism. That's another word for like backsliding. Mm -hmm. backsliding. Okay. So, three things. Uh, 24, God gave them over to uncleanness. 26, God gave them over to vile passions same sex. 28, because they didn't like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. Warped thinking. Do you know people who have warped thinking? Probably because they're not getting, they're not keeping God in their mind, in their knowledge. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you do first time with that, you agree with God yeah. that this is a sin. These guys are not agreeing Green. with God. Right. Exactly. These guys are, look at 18. They're suppressing it. They're suppressing the truth. When you're suppressing the truth about God, you're not confessing. You're not doing anything. You're not admitting anything. You're keeping Him out of your life. You're not retaining Him in your knowledge. And God says, okay, I've been trying to get your attention. attention. I've been sending the right people your way. You don't want anything to do with me. Are you sure about that? Okay, fine. This is how it's going to look like when you're not with me. When the prodigal son left, he had no care, no protection. He was out there and he was starving, was he not? Mm -hmm. When we don't want God in our life, he will allow us to experience how it is without his care. Yeah. Or his mm -hmm. protection. The... Uh, secular world has a, a song called Who Let the Wolves, Let the Dogs Out. 
the Christians can say who let the wolves out. <laughs> That's right. Oh my God, who let the wolves out? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But but the important thing to see here is if we don't rebound or confess, mm -hmm. then we're suppressing the truth. Mm -hmm. And if we continue to suppress the truth, this is what could happen. Not that it would, but that it could. Okay? So don't don't get worried and say, oh my gosh, tomorrow I don't wanna I don't wanna look at this guy and say, hey, you're cute. <laughs> no, I'm not saying I'm not saying that at all. <laughs> what I am saying is that this is the wrath of God being revealed. Uh -huh. Now let's just say, by the way, if there is someone who's going through this, that doesn't change my perspective on that person, just so you know. Just because a person struggles and they say, you know, I'm, I'm going through that. I don't look at them any different. Because, you know why? Because they're the one with the problem, not me. I am going to come alongside and try to help them. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm not going to say, you know, I know exactly what you're going to do. Because I don't. But I know the power that can deliver you. And the reason why that this person is like this, according to this, not my observation, not my experience, but based on the scripture, is because that person is so busy and is keeping God out of her life or his life. Possible. The bottom line is they're suppressing the truth. Mm -hmm. Right? So when you bottom line it, whoever that person is, all I have to do is say, okay, what's your study time like? How is your relationship with God? You're, you're confiding in me? Okay, I, let me do a diagnostic. Just be honest with me. I'm not going to say anything. Uh, when was the last time you got into the Word? Well, it's been a little while. I've been busy. But that's the problem right there. That's the culprit. Mm -hmm. So, while he's admitting, while she's admitting, you know, I've been so busy, I'm she busy, she's busy, that busy, I can at least say, look, now we know the, the remedy. Now we have to figure out how we can put this back into your life and into your schedule as a priority. Because if not, if you keep doing what you're doing, you'll keep getting what you're getting. That is, you know, coming alongside the belief, the weaker believer, that is the greatest example of what a stronger believer can do. Mm -hmm. Not to say anything negative, but to yeah. come alongside. That's the, the way that it should be, according should be. to Scripture. I don't see Jesus blasting people. Yep. Like when the woman was caught in the act, they didn't bring the man. He didn't say, serve you right, they should have stoned you. No. She's already guilty. She knows she's, she's wrong. And so, what does he do? He takes what she has been away from, and what a lot of believers are away from because of busyness. She ta he takes the Word of God and he says, this is the stuff that you don't want to get involved with, uh, lady, but I'm going to use it to parry the attacks of, of the accusers. Okay. Um, whoever hasn't sinned, cast the first stone. You're right. You're, it's... This is actionable, so this is worthy of death. So go ahead, hurl the first stone, whoever hasn't sinned. He takes the scriptures and handles it in such a way that he's consistent with the law, but at the same time he's piercing each and every one of them. And he says, uh, go ahead, take, take the first shot. Yeah. Whoever hasn't sinned, you should take the first shot. This is sad. Give it your hardest throat. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what happened? Yeah. Everybody leaves. Mm -hmm. this guy left first. What did he do? Did he stand up there and say, no, no, don't, don't? He used what people today are not using. The Word of God is designed to protect us, mm -hmm. not to cramp our style, not to be a killjoy, not to be a bother. <coughs> but to empower us to be connected to Him in fellowship. Mm -hmm. See, the woman is already guilty. Mm -hmm. You know, she's probably reeling from whatever she's feeling and whatever, right? Yeah. The abusers were right. They were right. 
They were right. But look what Jesus did. Yeah. He didn't he didn't he didn't advocate more guilt complex being laid on the woman. Yeah. He didn't. He didn't. But people today are you know That's they, what they, they, do. Do. they don't they'll get they up don't on get it. You're already out. Yeah. Down and out. They don't get up on it. So let me oh, go ahead, Arden. Oh. Let me let me just wrap up Romans yeah. okay. because it, then we'll go back to this. So you've got all these things going on. Now let's just say Freddie is struggling with, you know, 29 on down. And he admits that he's suppressing the truth. So what's the remedy for this? DJ. You have to go back a few verses. Because there were, in 18 it says for the right of guys being revealed. The word for is there. <laughs> Previous verse. Previous verse. Yeah. yeah. Remember what he says in verse 16? Very good. Good observation, mm -hmm. DJ. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Arlene, can you read verse 16? I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Okay. Now, a lot of people use this for evangelism. But it should not. And it's, it's, it's okay. I mean, there, I can see how this could be used for, like, uh, you know, believing in Jesus and you get salvation. But the word salvation simply means what? Do you remember? Deliverance. Deliverance. Ah, deliverance. What would, what, why would Paul talk about Deliverance. Does does anybody hear me? Deliverance. Oh yeah. How about maybe eighteen to thirty-two? Mm. So here's a guy who wants to marry a guy. Is there any hope for this guy? Yes. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for there's the power of God for deliverance. Deliverance from the power of sin. From the power of sin. Again. I'm not picking on any, any particular person. But I'm just stressing the importance of what the Scripture is communicating to us. There is a, a real turning over to self, which results in same-sex interest and light uh, orientation, uncleanness, debased mind. So as believers in Christ, we have to look at it and say, okay, this is a reality according to Scripture. Okay? And rather than skirt this and say, well, you know, we have to lead people, it's up to them, it's their own preference, it's their own decision, that's all true. But, this also indicates to us that if this person is being given over to self, because that's really what's going on, then this person is at odds with your Lord. And you have to consider that too. Would you protect this person here who is an acquaintance or a friend? Or would you side with your Lord who gave his son so that you can be adopted into the family and spend eternity with him? Is it more important to protect, if you want to use feelings, is it more important to protect his feelings or his feelings? Yes, his. Right? Roughly. God should never, God and everything that related to him should never be based on neutral ground. Nope. You've got to take a side. You should. And, and, and there's, a right, there's a, a right way to do it. Because when you're dealing with people who are experiencing 18 to 32, I tell you, they're, they're, they're having difficulty. Yeah, they're having difficulty. And this is not the time to show them what you've learned in Bible study. <laughs> right? They're not in the mood for that, but they can certainly benefit from some truth. Mm -hmm. Whether it's kernel of truth or a little bit more truth, but for sure it's not a time to start judging and saying, well, you're supposed to pick up your cross. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to count it all joy. No, that's not the, pro that's not the approach. Lee? Uh at the last of 17, he said, it is through faith that the righteous person has life. Yeah. And your faith, the object of your faith is to work. 
-hmm. And that's how we attain the righteousness. Yeah. In other words, God does the work in the person's life. Yes. To get him to do the right thing yeah. in his life. So it begins with verse 16, right? Yeah. So he's not ashamed of what? The gospel. The gospel. Why is he not ashamed? It's the power of our See, God. That's what 18 to 32 are lacking, power. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. True. Because God has turned them over to themselves and their sin nature is kicking their butt. They can't control this. God says, you don't want me a part of your life? Okay, you're suppressing the truth? Okay, boom. I turn you over to yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I give up. I, I'm done. I, I want out. Okay. I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God for salvation. Get into the gospel. That's the way back. Confess and get back on track. Rafi. Uh, these set of verses in Romans should never be used for evangelism. It's no. for discipleship and yeah. sanctification. It's for all of us. All of us. Yeah. It's brethren, actually. Yeah. So you can see the severity of keeping God out of the picture. You can see the severity and the importance of getting into the Word. <coughs> we don't want, like, uh, what was it? The last, the last example of wrath, 28. We don't want to experience 28 on down. They did not like to retain God, so God gave them over to a warped mind. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. I'm too busy for you, Lord. You, you know I have family. I have responsibilities. I have school. Really? Mm -hmm. You're going you're gonna to leave me out? Do you know that I gave you life? And you're just a steward of everything that I've given you, and now you're, you actually have the audacity to say that you're too busy for me. Did I not take care of your daughter? Did I not take care of your son? Did I not take care of your spouse? And you promised me this, you promised me that, and now you're going to, you don't have time for me. Okay, well, if that's the case, you know the protocol. If you suppress the truth long enough, then I have to allow you to experience this. I'm going to turn you over to yourself. Could be in the form of uncleanness, bio passions, or the base mind. <coughs> it's up to him. Okay? So, we have to retain God in our knowledge. How do we retain God in our knowledge? Ongoing studying of the scripture. Oh, really? Do I have to do this? I mean, life would be boring. <laughs> really? Do you think it'd be boring? Do you, do you want to not retain God in your knowledge and see if this is fun? It's actually exciting. It's exciting when you understand all that God has to offer. And that it's not, it's not designed to cramp your style or get in your way. I came that you might have life and life more abundantly. Where can you get that kind of a guarantee or promise? Mm. The world will offer you all kinds of things, but it doesn't provide stability, doesn't provide you assurance, doesn't provide you peace that's lasting. So when you get distracted with the things of the world and you listen to the undermining of Satan as he attacks the Word of God, mm. you might experience 18 and 32. Lee? Satan is constantly attacking the fiber of mankind. Yeah. Help it with the news. Uh, even the news that says that it's conservative. Mm -hmm. It's almost teaching the same gospel as the liberal gospel is. Right. Which is funny, if you listen to it, they, they say they're the same dogs doing the same behavior. Yeah. One is saying he's conservative and one is saying he's liberal. And it's amazing what they attack is God basic truth. Mm -hmm. And and when you into the word, you see it clearly. When you're out of the word, you don't see it clearly and you get this fear. Yeah. You get this fright going on, which undermines your faith. Yeah. And, and it gets you thinking that you can find an answer in man in this world. Yeah. There's no answer in this world. Yeah. That's There's right. No hope. Well, um, Tying this Romans 1 together, the solution to 18 to 32 is going back to 16. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they were ashamed of the gospel. Paul says, I'm not. Why? Because there's power in, and deliverance. That's what you guys need. You got you Christians, 
referring to 1832, they were embarrassed or ashamed, apparently. Okay? All right, so number one is rebound, right? So that's just acknowledging him bouncing back, okay? Number two, filling of the Holy Spirit. That's the, it means to be influenced by God the Holy Spirit. It, it is the empowerment that we need to learn and apply what? His word. His word. Reject the sin nature control of our lives and execute the Christian way of life. We are never told to live the Christian life on our own willpower or our own decision making. It's under His influence. The filling of the Holy Spirit solves the problem of, by, of being controlled by the sin nature and the lack of power to execute the Christian way of life. Galatians 5, 16 to 23 talks about this. Ephesians 5, 18. Don't be drunk, uh, but be filled. 1 John 1, 5 through 10, and 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 16, where we don't have the spirit of man, but we have the spirit of God. See? So it's important when you have a chance to look up some of these verses here, because it will support the importance of uh, the role and function of the Holy Spirit. Number three, we talked about this, the faith... Oh, sorry. Did you need there? Will you email this to us? Yeah. If you're interested, Maybe. I'll just email you the slides. Oh, yes. 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 I'll just email you. Thank you. Yes. No, that's each. <laughs> <laughs> that's each. Yeah. Each slide. Yeah. Each slide. Yeah. 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 Number three. Uh, the faith rest drill. Rather than seeking counsel from others or going into denial, we need to learn to claim the promises of God by faith. This means that the promises of God should be more real to us than our experiences, our emotions, our problems, or our circumstances. This technique, when properly used, results in a relaxed mental attitude about everything in life. The faith rest technique solves the problem of mental attitude sins, such as fear, worry, and, and anxiety. So you're resting. Mm -hmm. You're applying faith towards God because you're claiming His promise, and then because you're putting faith, you're applying faith and, and towards God, you are able to rest. So whatever circumstances you're going through, you can wake up the next day, you can take a shower, you can have a breakfast, and say, I'm off to look for a new job. I'm looking forward to what God has in store for me. Because you know that He's taking care of you. Okay? That's the faith rest drill. Number four, grace orientation. Arrogance creates problems. Humility solves problems. Why does humility solve problems? Well, because it's the, uh, that's the character trait of Jesus Christ Himself. He was made a little lower than the angels. If He can humble Himself, so can we. Arrogance will be, we will mirror and look more like Lucifer if we're arrogant. So take your pick, Jesus or Lucifer. If you want Lucifer, be arrogant. If you want to be like Christ, humility. When you grasp God's grace policy and how little you deserve the inconceivable bounty He provides, your soul is humbled within. Learn humility, the attitude for teachability, and problem solving, and build Christian virtue. Why do I say learn humility? Some people don't know how. Right? But when you, how can you learn it? When you look in the Word. When you see your Lord and Savior washing the feet of the disciples, mm -hmm. then who are you to be arrogant? You put yourself above Him. Now there's two lords. Mm -hmm. You and Him. Yeah. <coughs> right? So don't, don't go that route. You'll suppress the truth. So that's number four. Oh, did someone have their hand up? Okay. Uh, number five, doctrinal orientation. How can you concentrate on your obligations and enjoy a relaxed mental attitude when problems intrude on every aspect of your life? You ever ask that? Well, learn to think with the mind of Christ and apply that thinking to your circumstances. 
when you are inculcated with doctrinal norms, you're taking it in on a regular basis, the doctrinal norms and standards, you rely on God, you make good decisions from a position of strength, and you employ the problem-solving devices of spiritual maturity. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. That's the reason why we have to get into <coughs> this word. You can't apply what you don't know. Right? And yet you, you go around and say, oh yeah, I know the Lord, I love the Lord. What's it mean to love the Lord? Well, I just, you know, I love it. <laughs> That's usually where it stops for some. Rafi? And, and you know, the constant intake of, you know, from the scriptures, doctrines, you know, uh, uh, precepts, you know, yeah, commands yeah, and all yeah, that. Yeah. Over time, although it may, it may not be applicable at that moment in your life, but if it's stored up there, we have something to draw from. That's right. You know, in, in times of trouble and tribulation, I think yeah. we have something to draw yeah. from. Or something to reflect on. Yeah. And see, again, when you look at Jesus, he, he didn't bring his New King James Bible when he was dealing with Satan. Yeah. Yeah. He just had the word stored up in his mind, in his soul. But who else did? The Holy Spirit. The devil. The devil also knew it. But he was twisting it a little bit. Yes. So if the devil is studying it, then we should as well. So doctrinal orientation is the fifth problem-solving device. Again, what, what is the purpose of these ten problem-solving devices? It'll help you solve problems. <coughs> They're just categorical doctrines laid out so that when we see it, one, two, three, four, five, mm -hmm. all the way down to ten, we have something to aim for. Hey, you know I'm a little weak on the doctrinal orientation, so you know what, maybe I should be Thinking and, and, and thinking with the mind of Christ. How do I get that? Oh, i got to get into His Word. Maybe I can afford five minutes a day. It's better than nothing a day. Right? So. These viewpoints, these ten viewpoints, is the basic concept or basic prototype which Christ was. That's right. And this is how He dealt with His uh, ministry. Yeah. He was the first prototype to show us how to use these devices. Yeah. If, if, you, if you study the gospel, you see him using each one of these devices yeah. in some form. Yeah. And, and then you get amplification of it with Paul's letters. That's right. And other apostles. They actually talk upon these people. Sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah. The blueprint. Hmm? Can yeah. You say it's a blueprint? Yeah. Number six, personal sense of destiny. This is when you understand who you are and what you have as a result of being in union with Christ. You don't have much, that's okay. You're, you're going to have to receive a mansion in the future. That should settle it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what, what you're having or going through right now. You don't have your own home. You don't have a place to lay your head. You will one day. You'll be with the Lord. Right? You're, you're going to be a child of the King. Your you're, you're royalty. He's going to take care of you now. He's going to take care of you in the future if he isn't already taking care of you now. I guarantee you he's taking care of you now based on your circumstances and situation. It's us who may not be content. It's mm -hmm. us that may not be happy with our situation. Yeah. But he's taking care of us, nevertheless. Mm -hmm. right? It is the development of spiritual self-esteem <coughs> which changes the way we talk to self to others and to God, it is the place where you realize all that God has done for you, is doing for you, and is going to do for you. This doctrine solves the problem of not knowing our importance to God and His individual plan for our lives, both now and in the future. He has a plan for each and every one of you. You may not know what it is now, but as you get into His Word and he, as He directs and orchestrates your steps, you will experience His will for you. Romans 12.2 reminds us that as we're being transformed, we will ultimately discover that good and perfect will for our lives. But that's not apart from His Word. So when people say, I want to know what the will is for, uh, for my life from God. But you can't hear Him without listening to Him. It's hard. It's impossible. Right? So six is a personal sense of destiny. Number seven is a personal love for God the Father. 
You can love God only if you know Him through the study of His Word. We learn about God by learning about His character and His attributes. Personal love depends on the object of our love, not on the subject. Personal love for God is based on our thinking, not our emotions. Love for God motivates the believer to develop integrity and virtue in his soul. It develops confidence in God's plan to sustain you as you execute the Christian way of life. You may have re rec you, maybe you recall when I said that all prayers go to the Father, not to Jesus and not to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Jesus taught us how to pray. When you pray, you pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven. So prayers, all prayers go to the Father. Is it wrong to pray to Jesus, to pray to the Holy Spirit? It's not wrong, but neither is it uh, mentioned to pray to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And in fact, it's only the Father who is the recipient of all prayers. Who was Jesus praying to when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane? Father. Who does the Holy Spirit pray to when we can't pray? Romans 8. The is the Father ever praying to Jesus with the Holy Spirit? All prayers go to Him. Prophet. When I first started here about three and a half years ago, and when we covered all prayers should be directed to uh, the Father, it was a shocker because it yeah. was never taught that way. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm not in any way saying it's a sin. Yeah, it's not. But um, if I had to teach that the Father is praying or anything like that, I'd have a hard time. But when you, when, you, when you put all the prayers together and you look up the word prayer, it's the, Holy, it's the believer, it's Jesus, it's the Holy Spirit, and all prayers are going to the Father. No one else. And you never hear the Father praying because he's listening to the prayers. Right? So... Um, it develops confidence in God's plan to sustain you as you execute the Christian way of life. That's number seven. Number eight, impersonal love for all mankind. What is the most severe test in life? Not losing your job, not your health. People. I amen to that. Right? It's people. Learn to exhibit virtue love even towards those who are obnoxious or evil. When you obey and imitate the Lord, you can repay <coughs> insults with patience and humility, antagonism with compassion and kindness, and reserve the tranquility in your soul. Because if you start reacting and firing back, you're being depleted. You're being depleted of all your joy and happiness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the guy, the guy in the mirror is the hardest one I've ever the guy in the mirror? Yeah. <laughs> I've never looked at your mirror. <laughs> Rafi? I, I can say I have a personal love for Mitch, you know? <laughs> and he has a personal love for you. Yeah. Feelings mutual. Feelings mutual. Feelings mutual. Yeah, feelings mutual. That's true. You guys are good friends. Number nine, we're almost done. Two more. Uh, sharing the happiness of God is another problem-solving device for life and challenges that we face. Here we tap into God's happiness by following His plan, His pre-designed plan for us, which produces a permanent what? Contentment. That's what we all need in the soul. God's happiness is based on the truth of His Word. Therefore, we can share His happiness only if we have truth, which is Bible doctrine, <coughs> stored in our souls. You can't share in something you know nothing about. As we abide in Christ and His Word abides in us, we share His joy or happiness. This means that our happiness does not depend on who? People. People or circumstances. Very important. Keep that in mind. Our happiness and joy does not depend on people. It should depend on people and it shouldn't depend on circumstances. It should depend on the happiness of God as a result of our relationship with Him. It's relational, not circumstantial, and it isn't linked to others. God's happiness replaces the conditional, temporary, false happiness of the world. 
It solves the problem of unhappiness, pessimism, worry, complaining, and lack of confidence. John 15, 11. And then lastly, occupation with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is where we follow his example by learning to think in the same manner that he thinks, which is divine viewpoint thinking. What's the other viewpoint? Uh, human viewpoint. Human, human well, viewpoint, yeah. right? So you've got human viewpoint and divine viewpoint. We're really good at human viewpoint <coughs> because we're all human, right? And so it's normal and natural to try to give advice or to come up with solutions based on what we think, our experiences. But the Bible is full of experiences of men and women who've done, done many things with God before our time, and we can learn from them. So we have to think divine viewpoint. We have to mimic and copy what Jesus executed while he was here. By obeying divine mandates as he did, by making good decisions as he did, and by using the problem-solving <coughs> devices as he did. Christ used only eight of the ten problem-solving devices to always maintain a perfect mental attitude. He didn't use rebound. Because he never sinned. Because he never sinned. And occupation with Christ. Christ. Yeah. And to live an impeccable life. Uh, it is impossible to be occupied with someone that you do not know personally. You can, you can get to know the Lord Jesus Christ only by learning, believing, and applying the truth of His Word and by understanding His uniqueness. So I decided tonight that um, as we're winding down Christian suffering, that I would, this is basically his material too. This is his 10 problem solving devices. I just put it in a format so that we can see it visually. I'll email it to you guys if you want. I yeah. have your email address. Yes. So that way you have a copy of it. But these, these 10 problem solving devices are undergirded by the divine dynasphere. Mm -hmm. So think of the divine dynasphere as where it, it's the foundation. And this is the application of those, of those gates. Mm -hmm. Okay. So some of this, uh, he, he includes other things, but it's still, you know, the foundation is still the same, which is the divine dynasty, the palace, or the power, which ultimately resides in God himself and his word. So when you break it down, he, he likes to call it the ten problem-solving devices. So when you get hit with challenges and problems in life, it's easy to go down this list. If you commit this to memory, you'll be able to say, oh, you know what? Okay, I'm already, I've already rebound, I've already confessed. What's the next one? I need to be influenced by the Spirit of God. What's the next one? What's the next one? Faith rest. What's the next one? So you go down this list, and now you have something to, to hold your hand and assist you when your brother or sister in Christ is not there, because they're not always there for you, right? They have responsibilities, they have family, they have friends. And so when you actually think you're all by yourself, you're not. Why? Because you have the truth and the principles of God's Word at your disposal. Mm -hmm. This is what nobody else has outside of the royal family of God. Everybody else is more in tune with the world, the latest trend, the latest fashion, the latest things. And even if we take an interest in some of that, so long as you're not putting that as priority, I would say you're okay. But if that's your life, I can tell you that in time you're just going to be miserable. You're missing out on the things that God makes available solely because of the relationship between you and Him. It's all relational. The peace that you want, the content that you're after, the, the, the stability that you need is anchored in Him. Nothing else. So when you look at these ten problem-solving devices, when you go back and review some of this material in the book, you put it together, there's no reason why you can't weather the storm. You should be able to look at it and say, I, I, I'm ready. I'm not perfect, but I'm ready. We God, is, <laughs> God has provided <laughs> enough for us as His children yes, to be able to stand. Deal with too. <laughs> Let's close in a word of prayer, and next, next week is our last class. So, uh, by those who are taking this for more of a credit, uh, have a paper ready, one page paper. Pick anything out of this book. Maybe you might want to focus on rebound. 
I learned, you know, during the 14 weeks together, the importance of rebound. I've never understood how one can have stability and peace even though the circumstances around me is, is falling apart. Whatever it is, there's, the book is 200 plus pages. And if, if you look closely, I'm sure there's something in there that has caught your attention throughout the last 14 years. If you're not comfortable doing a presentation in the front, you don't have to. You can turn the paper in to me, but you get one grade lower. One grade lower. Oh. Okay? Because the ones who are willing to do it, and there, there are several of you, have you, you put in the time and you come up yes. in front and you share, so your paper is obviously going to be higher. Right? So... Um, if you are interested, if you're just doing this more for like um, personal edification, you don't have to do a paper. You can join us and I would encourage whoever wants to bring snacks and goodies, let's just have a good time. It's our last class together. Okay? So, are you going to do the Revelation in next class? And then, yeah, next class will be Revelation, not next week, the following week. We'll take one week off. Um, I might just put together the notes as we go. But we might, I might draw from one of Walbert's books. Oh, Walbert. But, but, um, I think it's going to be two weeks because after that is July 4th. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Oh. So, right. yeah, we'll, we'll do it after the 4th of July. Mm -hmm. So we'll take uh, two, weeks two weeks off. Two weeks, two weeks off. So, so that's a pretty smiling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate your time. Let's close the word of prayer and then uh, we'll call it a night. Father, we are... Uh, grateful for the time that you've afforded us so that we can study you and your word. We're um, grateful for all the things that you have done, <clears throat> the truth and principles that have um, been presented tonight, Lord, are such an encouragement. And so I trust and pray, Lord, that as we uh, continue to um, look at these principles, even after the course is finished, that we would not just look at it and study it, but that we would apply it to life, because ultimately, you've provided these things so that we would use it. <clears throat> so thank you, Father, for uh, these problem-solving devices, and ultimately your word, which really is the one that teaches us how to live the Christian life. We're so grateful for all the things that you've done, and we look forward to the things that you're going to do. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you.